This morning, as we prepare to get our hearts ready to take communion, it would be helpful to remember the year 1553. In 1553, Mary Tudor became the Queen of England. That began a uh, five-year reign as queen. And in the final four years of her being queen, she put to death no less than 288 Protestants. This is where she gets the name Bloody Mary. Some of the more notable martyrs that were killed by Queen Mary are John Rogers, a formidable Bible translator, John Hooper, the Bishop of Gloucester, Roland Taylor, a pastor and theologian, John Bradford, who was one of six preachers commissioned to preach the Reformation doctrines throughout England, Thomas Cranmer, the Archbishop of Canterbury and first leader of the Church of England. And there was also John Philpot, who, when he approached the place where he was to be burned, he actually kissed the stake and said this, shall I disdain to suffer at this stake seeing my Redeemer did not refuse to suffer a most vile death on the cross for me. He then proceeded to die as he quoted Psalms 106, 107, and 108, about 104 verses total. These Protestants who died, among them were about 55 women, even four children, history tells us. Why were they willing to die what Catholic doctrines did they reject that made them, in the church's mind at the time, the Catholic church, worthy of death? There were many different things, but the primary doctrine, the primary dogma of the Catholic church that made them worthy of death was the doctrine of the Eucharist or the Mass. It's what we call the Lord's Table or Communion. The very practice that we partake of every single week is what these men and women die for. J.C. Ryle says this, quote, on that doctrine, in almost every case, hence their life or death. If they did not believe and admit it, they were burned. So what is it about the Catholic teaching on the Lord's Supper that made so many willing to reject it and face death? It was the particular point called transubstantiation, or the real presence. This doctrine says essentially that when those people present in the mass take of the bread and wine, those elements actually become the body and blood of Jesus. When the priest utters the special words of consecration, those elements transubstantiate, the substance is transformed into the actual God-man, Jesus Christ. This is why everything takes place on an altar, because he sacrificed again, is the view, when the Eucharist is taken. And the Eucharist, in Catholic dogma, accomplishes the very same thing as Christ's death on the cross. Listen to one of their own theologians who says, quote, the purpose of the sacrifice is the same in the sacrifice of the mass as it is in the sacrifice of the cross, primarily the glorification of God, secondarily, atonement. Catholicism teaches that the cross and the Eucharist are one and the same. Now, th this is obviously littered with errors, and it would take a long time to go through all of them, but just notice how belief in this practice and that practice allows man to participate with Christ in atoning for his own sins. The priest, if he brings Christ down from heaven, which Paul says in Romans 10 is impossible, if the priest then sacrifices Christ again on the altar, and if the one who receives the Mass must continually partake so that God is able to save him, 
then obviously salvation is not dependent on God alone. That is not a gospel that saves. To look at that, we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 11. What is the real, the, the biblical teaching of Scripture on the Lord's Supper? So we're going to turn to 1 Corinthians 11. If you don't have a Bible, there are some guys on the side who are going to pass those out. And we want you to see the clear, unambiguous, unconfusing words of Jesus from 1 Corinthians 11. We'll start at verse 23. The Apostle Paul is teaching, correcting, rather, the, the practice of the Lord's Supper in Corinth. And he wasn't there on the, la- on the night when Jesus instituted this supper. But as we read in verse 23, Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. So what we're about to read, Paul's teaching on communion, he wasn't there, but he was actually told it by Jesus himself. He received it from the Lord and then delivered it to the Corinthians. What did he deliver to the Corinthians? He says that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Notice what Jesus doesn't say. He doesn't say, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in a resacrificing of me. He doesn't say, do this as often as you drink it in atoning for sins. That doctrine isn't in Scripture. How do we know Jesus wasn't being literal when he said, this is my body, this is my blood? Well, first, your first signal is, he says bread and cup. No one assumes that the cup is being transformed. So it's obviously representative of something. Verse 23 also says, when this happened, do you see it at the end of verse 23? When what? He was betrayed. It was the night when he was betrayed. What we do here every Sunday is obviously not a re-sacrificing of Christ. What Jesus did the first time wasn't him making the elements, his body, and be in representation of them being sacrificed. Because this is before he was even sacrificed. This happened before Jesus suffered. So the meaning is is rather simple, actually. Jesus says, this is my body. A representation, the bread is, a representation of Jesus' body. Uh, The contents of the cup, not the cup itself, is representative. It's a sign of the remembrance of his blood. And so in this practice, it is Christ's death that we are to remember. Jesus was well aware on the night when he was betrayed that he was preparing to endure the full wrath of God. When Jesus was on the cross, all of the sins, past, present, and future, of everyone who had ever sinned in thought, word, deed, action, motive, attitude, of those who believe in him, Jesus bore those sins of those people on himself. And all of the wrath and fury that God had toward those sins were exhausted on Christ in that few hours. And here, Jesus gives us something as simple as communion to remember, to proclaim. And he says that three times, the purpose of it, three times in this passage. Do this in remembrance of me, verse verse 24. Again in 25, do this in remembrance of me. In verse 26, you proclaim the Lord's death. 
It's a remembrance, a proclamation of something that happened. Every time we take communion, we affirm that God has saved us by faith alone, apart from good works. If this is a remembrance of something that has already happened 2,000 years ago, then obviously we're not accomplishing anything here today. It's already been done so that all we must do now is remember and believe. And that's, that's what this time is for. Christians, remember Christ. Remember that the same sins that you have committed this past week from the last time you took communion were born in Christ's body, and he suffered for them. That's why you don't have to. And if, if you are not clinging to that same hope, that same message, then we would admonish you not to take communion, but instead to consider as the bread and juice come by, just consider where you stand before God and where are you placing your hope. And if you have any questions about that, feel free to talk to me, anybody you saw up here uh, on the stage this morning. We would, we would love to talk to you more about the gospel. So the men are going to come now. Take when you're ready the bread and juice.